One of the questions that I'm asked most often is, when were you first interested in science? This question has always baffled me, and I never really knew how to answer it. And that's because, to me, science is curiosity, just wanting to know more about anything and everything. And this is something I think that most, if not all, people have. Personally, I remember traveling to tide pools when I was three or four years old and just wondering silly little things like why starfish had five legs or why the pools were only visible during certain times of the day. So already, before I could read or multiply numbers, I was interested in science. So I think a better question to ask is, what made you pursue a scientific career? And what made you dedicated to finding answers through experimentation? This is a question that actually can be answered. And the answer can help us build the framework needed to encourage more people to enter STEM fields. So today, I will talk about my journey and the factors that encouraged me to pursue a scientific career. A turning point for me was first grade when I did my first science fair project. Driven by a love for nature, I decided to investigate one of nature's most magnificent phenomena, the geyser. Particularly, I was interested in the origins of a geyser's power. So how could a geyser shoot water hundreds of feet into the air? I decided to model the pressure within a geyser using the pressure built up in a club soda bottle. The entire process was amazing, and I was hooked. Nothing beats the exhilaration of building something from scratch and learning something new about the world around us. So since first grade, during my yearly science fair projects, I decided to investigate nature from many different angles. For example, in second grade, I investigated Newtonian mechanics through an inclined plane. In third grade, I looked at the optics of the eye. In fourth and fifth grade, I looked at water quality testing. And in sixth grade, I concentrated on environmental management through ethanol production. So I think a key factor for me that encouraged me to pursue science was having this environment from a really young age that encouraged independent thinking and freedom of exploration. Then, in seventh grade, I discovered cellular and molecular biology, and I completely fell in love with it. I was even more fascinated with all the little things that happen in cells within our body. To me, it was nature at its finest. Only through the synchronization of tens of thousands of proteins and numerous cellular pathways, all too small for the eye to see, could the simplicity of life be realized. Since seventh grade, I've applied cellular and molecular biology principles to my projects be it through using surface antigens to detect salmonella or investigating protein folding. Then in sophomore year of high school, I discovered computational biology. And I thought this field was so fascinating because of how it combined concepts from both biology and computer science. And I really think that computational biology will allow us to maximize human potential by being able to understand these really complex biological interactions using an analytical approach. So since sophomore year, I've spent thousands of hours just learning everything I could about computational biology. I've kept up to date on the latest developments in more rapid ways to collect data or better ways to analyze data. I've written hundreds of programs and spent hours upon hours in a cell culture lab all for the purpose of delving deeper into my latest computational biology question. So I think another factor that was really influential in encouraging me to pursue science was having a focus, having that one field that I was willing to dedicate hours upon hours just researching and learning everything I possibly could. So now I'm going to talk about one specific exploration of mine in computational biology, and that's a diagnostic tool for breast cancer. 
So one of the main problems with breast cancer treatment today is that almost all patients are given chemotherapy to prevent metastases or the spread of breast cancer, when only about 30% of these patients would have developed metastases in the first place. And what this means is that many patients undergo the extremely severe side effects of chemotherapy without getting any real benefit. So the objective of my research was to delineate patients into two groups, those that would develop metastases and those that would remain metastases free. And in this way, we can tailor the, the appropriate long-term treatment plan by only giving chemotherapy to patients who would actually benefit from it. So these predictions have been attempted before, but I decided to take a new approach by using microRNAs. So microRNAs are these really small segments of nucleic acids. They're about 90 to 25 nucleotides long, and they play really important regulatory roles in cells. For example, one microRNA can regulate networks of almost 200 proteins. So I view these microRNAs as these gatekeepers of huge networks. And what this means is that if one microRNA is slightly upregulated or downregulated, this can have a cascade of effects. So for this reason, I hypothesized that microRNAs would make really good prognostic markers and be able to predict metastases. So to build these microRNA prognostic signatures, I conducted a two-phase project. The first phase was computational. So what I did is I downloaded a data set from the Gene Expression Omnibus. And the Gene Expression Omnibus is a public repository where scientists around the world can deposit their data so other people can analyze it in new and interesting ways. So I took this data set and I ran a whole bunch of statistical tests such as survival analysis and pathway analysis. And in this way, I was able to identify two microRNA prognostic signatures that computationally predicted metastases. I then moved on to the second phase of my research, which was cell culture work. So what I did here was try to validate the prognostic signatures that I discovered computationally in breast cancer cell lines. Essentially, I measured the expression of these microRNAs and correlated these expressions with the ability of cell lines to metastasize. A long story cut short, I was able to identify two microRNA prognostic signatures that can predict metastases. As you can see, there's a pretty good separation between the patients in the red, which are those that are likely to develop metastases, and those in black, which are likely to remain metastases free. And these prognostic signatures have been validated both computationally and experimentally. This work would not have been possible without the help of some pretty amazing mentors. I performed the computational portion of this project at Ingenuity Systems, which is a biotech in Redwood City. And there I had the opportunity to work with scientists, engineers, and statisticians. I performed the cell culture portion at a lab at Stanford University. And I was integrated into the lab community there. And I had the chance to work with graduate students, postdocs, and professors. So I think another factor that was really influential in encouraging me to pursue science was mentors. Mentors who were willing to share their wealth of experience with me and who were willing to guide me through the inevitable ups and downs of the scientific process. So now I'm going to talk about the last major factor that encouraged me to pursue science as a career, and that's my peers. Science, after all, is about collaboration and sharing research. And I've had the chance to present my work at some pretty amazing places. For example, in junior year, I participated in the International Biogenius Challenge and had the chance to present my work at the Bio Convention, which attracts about 20,000 people every year. In sophomore to senior year of high school, I presented at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, which attracts around 1,500 high school students from around the country and the world. Then, in my senior year, I was selected as a finalist of the Intel Science Talent Search. As one of the 40 finalists, I was treated to an unforgettable week in Washington, D.C. We had a chance to meet the president, we listened to panels of scientists from the National Institutes of Health, and we presented our projects to members of the public. But I think the most invaluable portion of this week was having a chance to meet all the other finalists and hear about their research. And I'm still in contact with many of them today. 
So having this network of peers who shared similar interests with me was very influential in encouraging me to pursue science. I know many times people think of research as this very individual or recluse career where you're sitting in front of a computer programming all day or you're sitting in a lab pipetting who knows what from one tube to another. But I found that this is not the case at all. Through science, I've had the chance to meet amazing people and work with amazing mentors. I attended my last formal science fair this April when I represented the International Biogenius Challenge at the 2015 White House Science Fair. I had a great time presenting my work to members of the National Institutes of Health once again, Bill Nye the Science Guy, and all the other invited students. And while this was my last official science fair, my journey is far from over. I look forward to continuing research and sharing my work at conferences in the future. Currently, I am a freshman at Stanford University, and I will be majoring in either physics or bioengineering. Stanford is the perfect place for me because of how it encourages collaboration and interdisciplinary thinking. I've, I'm a member of two student groups on campus. In Design for America, I'm involved in applying the design process to projects related to social good. In Stanford Students in Biodesign, I'm part of the journal committee, and we publish a quarterly journal with interviews of professors and other students. And I'm also looking forward to beginning undergraduate research this, either this quarter or in the summer. So what made me pursue a scientific career? For me, it was a combination of four things. First, it was having an environment from a really young age that encouraged me to go out and explore whatever I wanted to do. Then it was finding that focus, finding that one field that I was willing to spend so much time and energy just learning everything about. Then it was reaching out to mentors, mentors who were willing to share their wealth of experience with me. And lastly, it was having a network of peers, having friends with similar interests who were always willing to share their latest and greatest idea with me. So to any of you who are interested in pursuing science, either now as a high school student or perhaps as an undergrad, I encourage you to go look for these four things. We are really fortunate here at Monta Vista to have a wonderful environment of teachers and administrators who really encourage us to go out and create our own projects and do whatever we want and just to be creative. I then encourage you to find a focus, to look within yourself and find what really interests you and find what makes you tick and what, where your drive really lies. Then I, inspire, then I encourage you to reach out to mentors. I know it can seem intimidating at first, being a high school student, just emailing professors, but from what I've found, with every closed door, there's an open door. And all it takes is that one open door to uncover a truly amazing experience and a wonderful learning opportunity. And lastly, I encourage you to talk to your peers, to inspire one another, and just get your ideas flowing in conversation. Lastly, I encourage you to keep moving forward, to be adventurous, and to let your creativity and imagination take you beyond your wildest expectations. And with that, I'll leave you with the modified quote from one of my favorite movies. Yeah, thank you.